very teamy, so you've done a good job. <laughs> so now we're back to studying what? We're back to studying Galatians chapter 5. Remember, we for several weeks we've been talking about Martin Luther and different stories related to him. So now we're back. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Yes, we're coming back to verse 22. 21, yes. We'll, um, but now we're really at verse 22. Galatians 5, is that the last chapter? No, there's the next chapter 6, and then it would be finished. So I'm letting you know that after we're finished our study on Galatians <laughs> chapter 5 and 6, we will study stories in the Bible. Old Testament stories going through and we'll study those so we can learn the stories and understand the stories because you remember every book in the Old Testament talks about Jesus Christ every book it talks about Jesus so the stories help us understand more and more about Jesus and why those stories point to Jesus because Jesus is the center of the Bible. So we are going to review a little bit and really quick, you know, sections that we've already studied in <coughs> chapter 5. So we're talking about Christian life and what it's like. So it's a struggle. Yes, we will struggle. And we struggle with what? Sin? Mm -hmm. Another word? With the flesh. Oh. So the flesh <laughs> is, is like our sinful nature. It means our sinful nature. Same thing. So it says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Meaning, we depend on Him, we depend on God, we depend on the Holy Spirit to help us. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature or your flesh craves and what you want. And what will help us resist it. The sinful nature wants to do evil. And that is the exact opposite of what the Spirit wants. So that's a struggle. The Holy Spirit wants these things. The flesh wants other things, and they're quite opposite. And the Spirit gives us desires. We have desires, but it's new desires. Once we receive salvation, we get new desires that are given to us by the Spirit. And that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. So these two forces talking about two different things that can constantly fighting each other so you are not free meaning free to carry on or go through you're going to have a struggle so for example on the road you know it's it's clear but you have to watch out for what bumps there's bumps in the road so you slow down to get over those bumps, um, or maybe you've hit it too hard, and those are your failures. So maybe you're married, husband, wife have a good relationship, but sometimes there's bumps in that road that you'll hit, right? So it's really the same thing in our Christian life. Everybody okay? So the Christian life, we will struggle. So intentions means I have good meaning to go straight, but I'm going to hit bumps in the road. So secondly, worldly life. Christian life, now we're talking about worldly life. And the point of that is, is the works of the flesh. Paul... He made a list. You remember the list? We discussed it, you know, about different types of sins. 
It says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, talking about if you follow it, then the results are very clear. It happens. There's the result. It comes there. It's the evidence that you have flesh or of the flesh. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, the same like, you know, works of the devil, like tarot cards, like <clears throat> Ouija boards, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, and outbursts of anger and selfish ambition, dissension, causing turmoil, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. That whole list, is that finished? No, there's a lot more sins than that. But let me tell you again, as I have told you before, that anyone anyone living that kind of life or sort of life will not inherit the kingdom. So who does that apply to? People who are not believers, Megan says? Non-believers, correct. But all of us, all of us here, we're Christians. You say yes, but only God knows, right? He only knows if maybe some of us are Christians, you know, and then we backslide, you know, into our sins. Yes, it does happen. We're not perfect, no. But all of those who backslide into sin and they give up church and they continue into their sins, and they're against Christ and stray, are those Christians? No. So it's a warning to us, to all of us, because what if you thought you were saved and later found out that you're not? It can happen. We can get drawn into sin. Paul in the Bible names those who have strayed. So continue to be faithful to the Lord. <clears throat> Same thing that, that you're saying, because there's there's people in the church or who say I'm a Christian and maybe they really believe they are, but their living uh, their life is like the world lives and so they think it's okay they do not realize that it's not okay with God because everyone's living that way you know yeah yeah that's sad that's a sad situation yeah oh. so it's talking about non-believers yes but it's also a warning to us who are believers. We have to be careful. So it could be out of the blue, you know, we're wrong, realizing that I come back. Yeah, you can come back and be repentance of your sins. Yeah. But we are still as brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes. But I'm talking about those who backslide and are against the church, don't believe in Jesus, continue in their sins. We have to say that they are non-believers. So the third one was the works of the flesh. So why did Paul make a list? Why did he do that? Because Paul, he was trying to give counsel. If you set salvation, you have to read the Bible, keep it, and do not look at the world. 
you know, and try to reject sin and focus in on God and be faithful and continue with Him, and He will bless us. Right, the list is there, but it compares to what next? In verse 22, there is a comparison. There's a difference. If we did away with the listing of all the different types of sins and the works of the flesh, you really wouldn't know what the second list would mean. We wouldn't really see the difference, but there's a difference in the two <coughs> lists, so it makes it black and white. So, like, this is white. And then if you put black with it, then you know that that's white. You understand what the meaning of white means if you had a black piece of paper to compare it to. So that's what I mean when you say as clear as black and white. So we're talking now of the fruit of the spirits. It says, if you notice, but... What the word but mean? You know, it's just a little word. But what it means, you know, this list of negatives, but now we're talking about the positives. Something good. And that's the right path. So there's the wrong path, but now here's the right path. <coughs> says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. What's that kind of fruit? Becoming peace, joy, love, tenderness. Yeah? The fruit, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. What do you mean by this quote though? He says, remember recently we talked about the Holy Spirit gives us desires. You know, it's his works that are in us. And in the first place, when we trust Jesus Christ, it changes our hearts, right? Our hearts change. And so the Holy Spirit creates in us fruit. And that fruit does not randomly appear. You think of these things that I have to do. You know, like I gotta turn over a new leaf, I've gotta improve, I've got to stop cussing, I've got to need start saying right words and nice words. No, the Holy Spirit gives us fruit so that it shows. Because the Holy Spirit is doing work in us, He is creating the fruit. Not that He created plus, we ourselves also do it. No, it's 100% a gift from the Holy Spirit. When you trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in you, you change and you notice yourself that you have fruits. There's different signs for fruits, but you show that is the result of your faith in Christ. So you remember you trust Jesus Christ, you've already received righteousness, and then going forward, your works are fruit, which show that you've trusted in Jesus Christ. And it comes from him. So if I'm a Christian, and I'm good and faithful, and meet someone, and I try to explain to them over and over again, and I get angry, you know, I have to show fruit as they look and see what I do as a picture of Jesus. And that's the fruit. And that's what they see and they get attracted to that and I like that so they become interested right so it's obvious that we depend on the Holy Spirit not just depend but I mean depend it is not on nothing that I do <laughs> it is all through the Holy Spirit's work if it I trying you know, and I'm going to say I'm going to help myself. <coughs> you have to have the right attitude. And remember, remember, you're born a sinner. We struggle. We need to have the Holy Spirit in us and depend on him. So it's interesting. So I want to make sure this is clear and you understand. But I use the ESV. It says... Fruit. How many fruit are there? But the fruit. There's no S. 
And you say seven, one. It's saying one fruit though here. There's no S. It doesn't say, <coughs> but the fruits of the Spirit are. It doesn't say that. It says, but the fruit, one fruit. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a list of nine. Yes, there's nine kinds of fruit. The fruit is one, though. It's a whole. It means that this should be our character. And it has different kinds of fruit. But it's one character, not nine fruits. Just one fruit. That's the reason why we are not checking off a list saying, yes, I've been able to do kindness. Mm, I haven't done that enough. I don't have enough patience. I still need to do better. You know, I failed. I have to, get to make myself do better and improve. No. When we trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit gives us fruit. But that we are not successful and can we reach that bar? No. Why? Because of the flesh. We will never reach the bar. So we must depend on the Holy Spirit to help us grow and mature and depend on Him more and more and realizing that it is not my works because I fail at that. But when I grow in the Spirit, I depend on Him more and I notice the fruit that you have inside of you. You do have it. It's there. So at work, I have to control myself, and I pray to God, and he helps me calm myself. Any more discussion? Okay, so finally, tonight, we're going to talk about love. So tonight, we're only talking about the topic of love. You know, maybe you wanted to go through all of these. No, I'm going to ask you to hold on to that, but the most important is love. Why is it first? Because God loved us. I love you. Love, love. Why not put love down somewhere else in the list? But why is love listed first? Love one another that all goes together. These are all connected because of love. So like glue. You know, you're talking about glue. You use it to stick things together, right? So love is the glue. It sticks everything together. So the works of the flesh? No, everything would not be stuck together. There would be no unity. No, If there is no true love, there is no unity. So when we talk about love, it is from God. God gives us love because God is love. It is his character. And the Holy Spirit gives us that same love. And it comes from the Greek word. You remember the Greek word for love? Agape. He's, got it. He's from Greece himself, so that's the reason why. Um, so agape, it means Christian love. So it is not philo, meaning like close friendship love, like a brother, not that. Agape, what kind of love is that? It explains, it's a famous love without limits. So you remember the chapter is important, we know, in the Bible, what chapter? 316, John 316, no. I'm talking about Corinthians chapter 13. That's very important. You know, it's a chapter of love. So I picked a few verses from that. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 and 7, it says, Love is patient. Very patient. So, you know, mother and father, you know, they get frustrated with their children, you know. 
They get a little cranky, but you know, they love, right? But they be impatient and kind. Love is not jealous, meaning your brother, you know, gets a job promotion, you know, and you say, I've been in the company for a long time, but he's only been here a short time and he's gotten promoted. No, nope. you say, God's blessed you for that promotion. Jealousy should not be there. You know, in a marriage, call it. So, love is also not boastful. Saying, I'm better than this person or that person. And love is not proud. You know, about looking at myself and what I've done and what I did. Or rude. I don't know, there's just a sign for rude. Rude? I've never seen rude sign that way before. You're very rude. You know, but rude. Many people are doing that as a sign for rude, so I'll do that. So I'll, you know, I'll follow you. <laughs> no That's no what I'm doing, right? <laughs> uh -huh. Love does not demand its own way. Sometimes, you know, you have to accept and let another person get their way, right? And be patient. And show in love and let them have it. It is not irritable. And it does not keep records. Remember, it doesn't say, I remember you did all these things that did to me before. No, nope. you wipe the slate clean. You cannot be obsessed with that. You know, this not a list. You forgive them and let it go. You know, it's not a record keeping. It does not rejoice about something that had happened to a person. Maybe they've been convicted as being found guilty or found of doing something wrong, you know, thinking that they look better than that person. No. But it rejoices when the truth wins out. Meaning truth, it's the truth, that's what we believe. We are joyful in the truth. You know, maybe a situation where you'd be deceived and but the truth finally comes out you know you find joy in the truth you know things that are not done right things that are not fair to a person you're excited about that no so love never gives up never maybe sometimes you feel like in your marriage you know i don't like being married i want to give up no nope. love never gives up it continues and bears through, and then you will receive a blessing. Love is always hopeful because God is love. God will take care, and the things that God wants us to have, it will happen. That is in God's will. Always have hope. God is in control, and we are not, and endures through every circumstance. through every circumstance. So remember Lori recently said about love, love without no. limits. There's another word. Unconditional love. Meaning it doesn't require something to receive love. So for example, I love you, you know, Alan. If only if he gives me a Christmas gift. You know, he's Santa Claus, right? He's supposed to give me a Christmas gift. If he doesn't, then I don't love him. So that's a dependent love. I give him love regardless. It doesn't depend on what Alan does. I still love him. It doesn't require him to meet any criteria. Just the same as God loved us, he sent Jesus to die on the cross to save us from our sins. God loves he didn't have to do that. Did God feel like, okay, I'm obligated, I'll send Jesus? No, he didn't have to. You know, he could let us all gone to hell. Would he have been wrong to do that? No, he was holy, or he is holy. But he wanted 
to send Jesus for us because he loves. He didn't require us to do anything first. He came, died on the cross for us as a sinner while we still hated him. I forgot what you said. Because you always give, give, give. You love me because I always give, right? He gave me all in all a pair of shoes. Very nice. He's given it to me. Yes. Yes, I do love it. No, no, that's not what I mean. Okay. So now my point is unconditional love. That God accepts you just the way you are? Is that what I mean by the word unconditional love? You're a sinner. God still accepts you? What do you think? Do you think that means that? At first, when we are saved, yes. I think that's true. God accepts us just like we are sinners when we receive salvation. But... He loves us so much. He wants us to become like his son. Yes. So, you know, like a preacher who smiles. God accepts you regardless of who you are. Whether your life you enjoy for yourself, God still accepts it. No, that is not what unconditional love means here. You know... Mr. Rogers, you know, is a nice gentleman. It was a TV show. You know, I love you no matter what. You know, God's not like that. God loves, wow, yes. He himself, though, is holy and he is against sin. He cannot accept sin, right? He accepts us as we are, born into our sins. He accepts us. And we can go to heaven regardless? No. So God loves me just as I am. Is that true? No. You remember three things from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 13, verse 13. Three things will last forever. What are through the three? Faith, hope, and love. And it's obvious, he's talking about love, his love for his people that will be forever. Faith, hope, and love. Forever love. Remember, that's what we're saying here. That God has already warned us through Noah. He said, you know, to come on to the ark, repent, and the people refused. You remember? And how many people believed and repented and came onto the ark? Eight. Eight. That was it. On the ark. All of the people who were left had rebelled. They enjoyed their sins. They enjoyed their different <coughs> idols and worshiping. You know, you accept the picture with a smile. God loves you. Right? Do you accept that it shows that that's okay? You know, there's a smile with a sign that says God loves you. Is that the way it is? That's not the kind of love. Regardless of who you are, does that kind of love? No, there is judgment. There's a flood that came and killed people. But did God sit there and sit there and say, I still love you? No. Are you clear about that? God's love for us is forever. He loves each person, yes. People in all nations, not only the Jews. God loves the people and those who will trust in Jesus Christ. Are you seeing a little confused, Jojo? The ark. How many people were in the ark? Eight. Talking about all the people outside. They all drowned. They all died. God had judgment against them. 
I know it's very sensitive and very tough for us, but it's true. God loves us, and he wants us to trust in Jesus for our salvation. So this is not true. God loves has holy demands. You remember, you have to always remember God is holy. You know, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 6, talking about the angels, you know, singing, they, what did they say again three times? Holy, holy, holy. Not love, love, love. <laughs> no, that's not what they said. He said, holy, holy, holy. <laughs> so God's love demands that we repent and believe. But it's hard for us to be perfect before we die, right? Remember, though, I'm not talking about us being perfect. The only person that was perfect was Jesus. He was fully perfect, and he took our sins. God looked at Jesus. He sees Jesus. He doesn't see us. You know, remember we talked about perfection. Was Catholics believed that, that there was perfection was the goal. But we know that we are not perfect until when? We get to heaven. Amen? So anybody want to discuss that? So when we get to heaven, it will be perfection. You know, what did John 3, 16? You know, that's the next verse we'll discuss. So for God so loved the world, and he showed it by giving his one and only Son, that everyone or anyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 Finished? No, it's not finished. You have to look at verse 18. It says, There is no judgment against anyone who believes in Jesus, but... And remember, there's a but here. Anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged. Why? Because they didn't believe in God's one and only son. So you must understand that all those who do not believe in Jesus Christ, they have already been judged. Already. Already judged. They will be punished. So some atheists, you know, they have been transformed and believe in Jesus. And lots of people have been changed. We've been sinners. We've been changed and transformed and we believe in Jesus. It's only through his grace. It says anyone, anyone in the mafia, maybe, you know, like, you know, the movie The Godfather, you know, it was an evil man in there. But it's possible that God could change their heart and he could have an understanding of the gospel and be saved. So it is through grace. So meaning we, God has already judged those who do not believe. Judgment is finished. That means that we are all good and can do away with them? No. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to spread the gospel and encourage. We are to love them. We love them, so when we see them do good things like Tommy giving me clothes, like shoes, you know, I love you, I love you because they've done good things, no? No, nope. even those who are against us, we still love. We are supposed to love other people regardless of their sins. It doesn't mean that we support their sins and accept it, but we love the person. And as they see us love them and what we do, 
and then they will start seeing the light that we are sharing with them and that love will help them change and then they will get away from their sins. I'm going to ask you to preach the next time I'm not here. <laughs> no. Okay, I guess I'll have to prepare and preach. <laughs> okay, so you see here, God loves her. So secondly, is equally important, love your neighbors as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. To love your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? The neighbor right next door? Who lives next door to you? No, everyone is your neighbor. It says, but to you who are willing to listen and heed, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. It's hard. It is hard, but we can. How? We show love, yes, but how do we have love? We depend on the Holy Spirit. He gives us the fruit, and then we can love, and we can honestly love our neighbors and love those who hate us. You know, that will be mind-blowing to them. You love me? What? And they'll see God in you. Amen? So the Holy Spirit is with you, in you. You have fruit. That includes love. So it says, you know, shows clearly that no one person has ever seen God. But if we love each other... God lives in us. And his love is brought to full expression, meaning showing, revealed in our actions. Not just speech or in what we say, but we show love. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Amen? Amen. So you who have true love that God has given us, right? Do we have that love? Yes. Those who have believed in Jesus Christ for salvation, we have love, and it comes from God. How do you continue to love people, your neighbors, your husband, your wife, your enemy, your friends? How do you continue to love them? By depending, again, I'm <laughs> going to ask you to preach this Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> love <laughs> so next week no I'm sorry in next two weeks mm -hmm. we'll talk about joy peace patience those maybe two or three of them maybe all three but let's go ahead and close in prayer Father we thank you Lord for this scripture wow it's really we feel so little knowing that we are born as sinners. But thank you for transforming and changing as making us new people in Christ. Everything through the Holy Spirit that you give us, everything we need, our tools, so that we can show love and that we can show Christ and that people will be attracted to Jesus through us. Lord, we pray that you help us remember that we do have flesh, but we depend on the Holy Spirit always. And help us to remember that you can do wonderful things through us. If we continue in our sins and we play with it into sin, you will, it will not work. You will not be able to work through us. But help us to repent and depend on the Holy Spirit. And thank you, Lord, for your promise that you've already begun the work in us and that you will finish the work in us. And that when we get to your glory, until we get to your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.